It's uh, Don Walsh. I'm a retired U.S. Navy captain. Um, for most of my naval career, I was in submarines. Uh, and then that was, if you can say, briefly interrupted by this thing behind me, uh, Trieste, where I worked for three and a half years. Um, my, uh, other than being, you know, in submarines, I had, I was captain of a submarine in a former life. Uh, I also, uh, while in the Navy, went through uh, oceanographic uh, graduate school and got my master's, my doctorate, Texas A&M University. So from then on, I was kind of uh, in, in, uh, assigned to things related to the oceans. In fact, all my short time in the Navy was in research and development with a special nod to our Office of Naval Research, who uh, sponsored so much of this, the Trieste program. And uh, I, in fact, I ended up uh, being Deputy Director of Navy Laboratories when I retired. So I was always in research and development when I was ashore and submarine-related duties when I was at sea. The fact is, it was, uh, and I don't mean to be precious, but it was a longer day at the office. Now, uh, if you were an aviator, you would understand what I'm going to say. That is, uh, when you get your airplane out of the hangar, you pre-flight it. You go through all the checks, then you go fly it, and after you're finished flying, you uh, uh, demobilize, if you will. You put it away, but you just got to do it before you put it back in the hangar. The same way with what we did with the Trieste. Um, we, uh, we went out to Guam about six months before the deep dive and did progressively deeper dives. But the manipulations, the readiness before and after the dives was exactly the same. Whether we dove in the harbor at 100 feet or offshore at 20,000 feet, it was the same. Longer day, what makes the day longer is how long your flight was or how long your dive was. So when I say it was a longer day at the office, I'm not trying to be cute, it's just a fact. And by the time we got ready to meet make the deep dive, uh, we had pretty much got familiar with the old girl's habits, and noises and sounds and what to look for. And the whole idea of these increasingly deeper test dives was to prove out the system. Because uh, we were not doing this for science. Uh, Picard and myself, Jacques Picard and myself were two engineers, like test pilots on a new airplane. Our job was to get it and get it ready for the Navy and for civilian oceanographers to use, but we had to make sure it was reliable, safe, and, and productive for their work. Uh, now, o &R made the decision to buy it uh, in uh, January 1958 from the Picards, uh, but it was our job at the Navy Laboratory in San Diego, Navy Electronics Laboratory, to take it, operate it, uh, uh, make sure it was absolutely reliable and safe, and uh, to perhaps enhance its capabilities new sensors, new samplers, things like that that we worked on. So for those six months, we were continuously doing that. Something broke, fell off, we fixed it, repaired it. And by the time we made a deep dive, then we're sort of the pinnacle of many months of preparation. And, and for our little team, we were just 14 people, uh, mixed civilian and Navy military, uh, civilian military, Navy, from the lab. And I had, uh, I think, seven, we we're only about 14 people and seven Navy, uh, Navy type, uniform types. Um, so we were kind of seven days a week. It was hard work, uh, but we did, uh, we were a little sensitive to the, to the weather uh, gods in that January is a good month to operate, sort of between two seasons out there in Guam. So the, the idea of getting um, a good sea state and being able to dive was very important to us. We didn't want to get, because this thing's very fragile and uh, we, it's 200 miles offshore, and by the time we drag it out there at five knots, that was maximum speed we could do without stuff falling off, uh, we want to make damn sure that we we're ready to dive. So we all that stirred into it, and January is pretty much our target for doing the deep dive, the you know, best chances for success. So um, it, was, it was an exciting day, but also both Jacques and myself felt that, well, this is the payoff. We have promised people we're going to do something. We were pretty much on time and on budget. And uh, our masters uh, in Washington and at the Navy lab kind of left us alone. But we had good funding. And so uh, our little team was able to do a lot and without any interruption of press, and media, and so on. People, this pretty standard question uh, is, were you afraid? 
And, uh, you know, fear doesn't enter into any of this because if you're afraid, then you lose your mental acuity, the ability to deal with, uh, with uh, issues, the, the unknown. And we'd spent that seven months in Guam eliminating as many variables, things that were a little, you know, dodgy, didn't work well, we'd replace and fix, we'd add stuff in. So we pretty much had refined the system to operate as best we knew how. But still going with things that you didn't think of or couldn't control, but all the things you could control, which I call the variables, we tried to get out of the system before we made the deep dive. <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, and so the, the mindset on that day is, you know, you're, you're very focused on what you're doing. You're always running through your head, what ifs? If this happens, what do I do? So on and so forth. And at that point, you pull a plug and dive and hope you got it right. I think the importance is uh, that a small group of Navy people had the vision to see that uh, exploring all corners of the world ocean, if you will, was pretty important uh, for naval operations and perhaps enhancing the submarine force. And uh, we were all submarine types the, on the military side. And this was an extension of uh, uh, submarine operations as well. It's not really a submarine, of course, but the closest job description you could get in the Navy was uh, for bathyscaphe pilot or submersible pilot was submarine qualification. Uh, there were only two of these things in the world at the time. So if you, if you look back again, aviation history, uh, it's like when Glenn Curtis and the Wright brothers had, there were two airplanes in the world and, and uh, you take turns flying them. Uh, they, uh, it was just the very beginning. So everything on this uh, had to be designed by us and made by us because there were any commercial vendors, no catalog that sold parts that were qualified for 20, 000, uh, 16,000 PSI, eight tons per square inch pressure, and to do the things you want to do. Cameras, lights, samplers, uh, sensors, uh, instrument sensors, all of that we had to design and build or have built. And so we were writing the book for uh, deep ocean operations uh, because the trenches in the world ocean only are 2% of the total area of the seafloor. If you can dive to 20,000 feet, you can see 98% of the seafloor. We're going to 36,000 feet in this thing. So it was really uh, mare incognita, the unknown sea down there. And uh, But what's the knock-on effect? Well, when I go to trade shows today, 60 years later, and I look at these uh, vehicles, of course, those days we didn't have unmanned, like the underwater drones uh, or tethered ones like the remotely operated vehicles. And manned vehicle was the only thing we had. Why? Because it was easier to put a person in something like this to do the job than we could use robotics of the time, you know, vacuum tubes and uh, not very good batteries or batteries that took up so much space there's no room for the people. And so it's all very primitive. And the most reliable thing you stuff in this thing was to humans, because the human brain is a pretty good computer. So that, uh, today, you've got lots of choices. In fact, I'd, I'd maintain that the uh, heavy lifting for deep ocean exploration in out your future years from now will be unmanned systems, because robotics and the, the advent of AI moving very quickly and capability of these things will always be room for a person, a, uh, people there that'll be just on the on the fringe of deep ocean exploration because the vehicles are so reliable today so productive low cost and if something goes wrong you don't have to write a letter to the widow you know so it's uh, there's a lot to be said for it i don't want to talk against my own experience but you know that was six decades ago six decades before i made this dive they didn't even have the first airplane. That gives you an idea of the spatial distance between where you start and what's going on today. I get asked a lot by people, uh, well, Dr. Walsh, what's, what's different from a nuclear submarine? And I said, that's like standing Wilbur Wright in front of a 747 and saying, well, what's the difference between your airplane and this one? But when I go to the trade shows, coming back to my thought, I can see our fingerprints, our DNA on everything that where we first started, underwater manipulators, mechanical arms and hands, the cameras, the lights that we developed, the things we needed to make this an efficient uh, oceanographic or scientific platform. Uh, and that gives me a great deal of pleasure. Uh, you talk to young people in the trade show on the, you know, on the stands, and 
some kind of whiz bang underwater vehicle and and you tell them, well, I used to do this sort of thing a few years ago, and their eyes kind of glaze over. So the young ones aren't very interested. So that comes back then to uh, a question you asked a moment ago, and that is, what's the Malacan effect? What's the important thing? The Navy, and to, let's say, studies the ocean as a whole. We were the first of this kind of work, in situ, we call it. That is, taking the trained eye and the trained mind to the workplace, not sitting on top, on a ship where you can't see under the water, that opaque barrier, uh, you actually go into it. The first way we got to do that was in the late 50s, actually contemporary with when we started, and that was SCUBA, that a, you know, a Scripps Institution or University of Washington, Texas A&M, for a few hundred dollars could buy uh, diving equipment, train a PhD scientist, an oceanographer, to do his own work in situ low cost, but of course limited, because you're only looking at about a sort of a hundred foot maximum working depth and uh, for an a ordinary scuba diver. So that's, that's what we did in being able to lead people into the, the ocean depths. It was not for record setting. 